where to begin. The important thing is where to stop. <laughs> um, as a founder of the Graduate Group in Ecology, it's a real pleasure to be able to give a talk to them after, uh, I think I haven't uh, given this seminar maybe for 15 years or so. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, sort of a broad range of activities and, and go fairly quickly uh, because as usual I have more slides than I should be showing but I just you know I love every one of them and it's really hard to eliminate them. So uh, I came to Davis in 1952, no uh, 1958, I've only graduated from college in 52 and uh, when I came into town, uh, there wasn't a single light on, and uh, tumbleweed was blowing down Main Street and newspapers, and uh, I swear there were hitching posts along the Main Street. But, uh, that hasn't been confirmed. <laughs> but uh, I just uh, never left Davis. It's a great place to go to school, it's a great place to teach at, and I've enjoyed uh, half a century of it. Today, uh, I want to begin by uh, sort of quickly reviewing what I consider sort of a world water crisis. Um, water, not oil, is uh, really essential for uh, human livelihood. I think we're, what, around 98 percent water. And uh, we're suffering uh, from a whole series of uh, related uh, interacting problems. Uh, as the price of oil goes up, uh, more fertilizers are necessary to grow the food for a uh, bludgeoning population. Uh, we don't hear much about uh, population explosion uh, since uh, Ehrlich uh, about 40 years ago uh, presented the population bomb uh, in Chicago. Actually, I came back from Lake Baikal uh, to attend that. Uh, on top of that, we have uh, this uh, problem of uh, carbon dioxide and methane increases, uh, global warming, uh, which is eutrophicating, uh, greening uh, the lakes of the world at a uh, very distressing rate. Uh, this too then is tied in with the oil problem because uh, to, to clean up water, you've got to use energy. Uh, desalination, for instance, is a, is a very heavy use of water. And further, uh, the Green Revolution, which supplied uh, the, the food supply, which has prevented uh, serious famines in uh, areas particularly like India over the years, is going to cost more and more and be harder and harder uh, to obtain for uh, developing nations. And uh, on top of all this is a general decline in the quality of water. Uh, you go to China, I've been there uh, about four times in the last six years, uh, everybody's drinking bottled water. Uh, drinkable water is a real commodity uh, throughout the world. Uh, people would love to feel that uh, we don't have global warming. Uh, the oil companies spent small fortunes trying to uh, convince us that uh, the climate wasn't changing. Uh, but we find that uh, carbon dioxide concentrations are now the highest uh, that they've been uh, in the last uh, 800,000 years. And it's not just the, uh, the fact that they've increased, it's the accelerating rate that they're increasing. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, 1990, uh, we were increasing at uh, about 1% per year. Uh, by 2000 to 2008, uh, we were increasing by about 3.4%. And uh, just look at these rates of increase uh, over these three time periods. The rate of increase is accelerating. Uh, one of the other uh, problems driving global warming, of course, is the loss of the Arctic uh, ice pack. And uh, this shows uh, the decline in coverage uh, 
over the years from 1970 up to 29 uh, or 10. And uh, I'm always, uh, I was always really impressed by uh, a book I read at a tender age. Uh, it was called The Northwest Passage. Uh, any of you read The Northwest Passage? Uh, the uh, preface to it uh, really struck me, and I, I think I still remember it. It says, uh, on every side of us are men who search perpetually for their own personal Northwest Passage, risking fame, fortune, and life itself in this vain but hopeful quest. And who can say that they are not happier than wiser, duller folk who sit at home and with sour laughs deride the searchers of this fabled thoroughfare? this panacea for the affliction of the humdrum world. And now, if we look at uh, passages, uh, there were 69 of them between 1906 uh, and uh, 2010. Uh, we have now had 25 transects in uh, 2010 alone. Uh, so the Northwest Passage is opening as the ice uh, disappears. Uh, this shows uh, white ice, uh, which is 10 years or older, uh, from April uh, 1980 uh, to April 2007. Uh, you can see that uh, by 2007 we've lost a great deal of it, and we even have a, a really nice picture of it. Uh, as a video as it breaks loose and floats off. Now this loss of uh, albedo, uh, the reflection of sunlight back into the atmosphere, uh, means that the oceans uh, can absorb uh, the heat directly. And we've seen lots of evidence of this already as uh, hurricanes increase uh, and possibly even the cluster of tornadoes has been a factor. Uh, other uh, elements of global warming uh, that uh, the oil companies have liked to ignore uh, are, for example, uh, the loss of uh, uh, the uh, glaciers in the uh, Himalayas. These feed the 70 mightiest rivers in Asia and they are receding at a rapid rate. Uh, I can't help feeling that having uh, a glacier named after you in the Antarctic is sort of a cold honor, uh, particularly since it, uh, the, inter interestingly enough, and you might think about this, why is the uh, northern hemisphere uh, warming so much more rapidly uh, than the uh, southern hemisphere? Anybody volunteer an answer for that? I'm kind of back to my teaching mode now. Uh, more land mass, maybe? More land mass in the, in the northern hemisphere and lots of water, which as we know is one of the uh, great uh, sources of heat absorption uh, that we have. And that's the reason uh, the uh, land mass uh, to water mass is so much greater in the northern hemisphere. And Alaska is warming at uh, just an incredible rate, a uh, frightening rate. Uh, one of our uh, Davis graduates, uh, Katie Walter, uh, grew up in Reno, uh, came and did a master's degree at Lake Tahoe on the uh, Eurasian milfoil, one of the invasive species at uh, the Tahoe Keys, uh, went off to Alaska uh, to do her PhD and uh, then did it uh, in the Russian uh, Siberian uh, Arctic. And uh, here she's cut a hole uh, through a lake and lit the methane uh, that uh, extends higher than this slide covers. Uh, as the tundra melts, uh, the methane production is increasing at a drastic rate. and. Uh, it's very uncomfortable to understand that methane is about 24 times as potent a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide. 
uh, the permafrost is melting, uh, it's exposing all kinds of uh, mammoth remains uh, in the high Arctic already, and uh, as uh, the tundra melts, it gives up its water, the, the lakes are rising in, in Mongolia, and uh, pretty soon that uh, water held in the uh, tundra uh, will end up in the oceans. Uh, this problem of uh, world water problems is nowhere, nowhere more evident uh, than in China. Uh, China has a really serious uh, water problem. Uh, in this particular uh, Lake Kunming, uh, where I attended a uh, conference in uh, 2001, uh, as you cross the lake you could barely breathe because of the uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, produced uh, by decaying organic material in the bottom of the lake. Uh, the water was actually black uh, from, from this. Uh, they made the mistake of uh, deciding they'd clean up the lake by dredging. Uh, things buried, men want dug up again. And of course all they did was uh, expose a thousand years of, uh, of organic pollution uh, of this lake and uh, made things much worse. Uh, same thing came up uh, when I was uh, an advisor for, at Oak Ridge uh, where uh, there was the idea of digging up uh, the Tennessee Valley lakes uh, to remove uh, the radiation that had seeped out of uh, Oak Ridge uh, during the atomic bomb uh, uranium production. And uh, you have a perfect cesium uh, and a a perfect mercury uh, curve that uh, corresponds there. So had they gone in and dredged those lakes uh, to remove this material, they just would have exposed it. Uh, same thing with mercury down in Gibraltar Reservoir uh, on our west coast. Uh, it's got a load of mercury that you don't want to re-expose <coughs> on the mercury mines along its side. Uh, this is uh, Lake Biwa in uh, Japan. I've been there uh, several times. Uh, we're currently uh, with uh, Michio Kumagai producing a book on the impact of uh, climatic change, which seems to be more uh, uh, agreeable uh, to uh, much of the political community than global warming. They just don't like global warming. Uh, certainly. Chevron, uh, BP, uh, Texaco and the like um, really made their dent on, on communication uh, when they came down so successfully uh, for quite a while, certainly through the former administration, on uh, the impact of uh, global warming. Uh, so we've all retreated more or less to climatic change. Maybe we're going into a new ice age. Uh, another example of uh, the loss of a very important uh, water source, one of the largest lakes in the world really, was the Sea of Aral. And uh, Stalin decided that uh, he would grow cotton uh, on the watershed and diverted the uh, streams feeding the lake, uh, Sea of Aral uh, for cotton production. And as you can see, the, uh, this is the literal dry zone has just steadily increased. Uh, the lake has now been split into two parts. Uh, 16,000 fishermen and cannery workers uh, lost their jobs as the fishery uh, just uh, completely uh, died. Uh, another example of uh, really uh, poor uh, water management. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Flato's uh, activity at Lake Tahoe, uh, we now have uh, some really state-of-the-art uh, oceanographic level uh, buoys out on the lake uh, recording a whole series of variables uh, down the water column and uh, supplied by a ship to shore uh, communication through tel 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 <laughs> cell phone technology. Uh, so you can just call up the buoy and find out exactly what's happening uh, in the physical limnology uh, down the water column. 
Do you have a chlorophyll sensor on that now? Um, on most buoys, no. Hmm. Anyway, that'll be a nice addition. Biology's not that important. Uh, people <laughs> wonder why uh, Tahoe is uh, such a clear, clean lake, and uh, most of them don't realize that uh, it doesn't have very much of a watershed. Uh, wrong button. Uh, the white represents uh, the 800 square kilometers of watershed and the blue of the lake is some 500. So most highly productive lakes that uh, can produce a lot of fish, uh, turn green with algal growth, uh, tend to have a 10 to 1 uh, watershed to uh, lake ratio. And uh, Tahoe has only 1.6 to 1. So a lot of the uh, water entering Tahoe falls directly uh, on the lake as uh, rain and snow and uh, you have a very low fertility uh, mainly decomposed granite and some volcanics around the lake uh, which don't provide a lot of dissolved nutrients. Uh, hence uh, when I got to Tahoe in uh, 1958 and 59 uh, you could see down into the lake at this really important piece of limnological and oceanographic gear, the Secchi disc, invented by Father Secchi aboard the Immaculate Concepcione. The Pope actually had a, uh, a navy in those days, and Father Secchi uh, decided it was very important to see how uh, much transparency you had, so he fitted a uh, white canvas uh, over a steel uh, circle uh, lowered it into the water till it disappeared, pulled it back up again until he could see it again, and that has been Secchi depth uh, ever since. And considering that the light goes down to the disc and back to your eye, it's a very good integration of transparency. And it's those uh, values, I think if we did one thing right at uh, Lake Tahoe in the early days, is that we kept it simple. People really could understand Secchi depth, whereas uh, primary productivity uh, didn't uh, turn a lot of heads. Now, the USGS uh, had hoped to have this online for the Clinton Gore visit to the lake, uh, but a few years later they were able to uh, complete side scan sonar uh, rendition uh, of the lake. And, uh, if you look over here, this is Tahoma, and if we go back a slide, you can see this piece of real estate over on the west shore is gone. A major earthquake uh, <coughs> occurred, and uh, this debris field actually uh, developed from that uh, our earth slide into the lake, uh, probably producing a tsunami uh, possibly of 30 feet in elevation. Uh, the lesson there is if the ground starts to shake and you're at Tahoe, don't run down to watch the water recede, head for the high ground as fast as you can uh, because such an event uh, could easily uh, occur again uh, when we consider that uh, there's a nice fault running right out of Tahoe City, another big fault out of Incline Village over here and uh, we do have, have a uh, earthquake displacement uh, of uh, full 10 meters that uh, the Scripps group were able to uh, map with seismic uh, gear. If we look at uh, the history of Tahoe quickly uh, and skip the uh, gold mining, uh, the uh, loss of the entire Tahoe forest. The major, major perturbation of Lake Tahoe was actually in the uh, 1860s uh, when gold was discovered uh, at Nevada City. And uh, as a result, uh, most of the basin uh, was clear cut. Uh, we have a few small stands of, of old growth timber that uh, they didn't get to and these are, have been intensively studied by uh, Professor Michael Barber, uh, who's an old growth specialist. 
Uh, but after uh, the, the uh, gold ran out and the uh, timber of the Tahoe Basin uh, found its grave in the mines of the Comstock, uh, the lake did uh, make a recovery. The lumber mills were closed. Uh, we had a touristic railway uh, utilizing the track and, and uh, engine that had been used for the lumbering activity. Uh, then a whole series of introduction. Uh, crayfish, California crayfish, uh, uh, Pasifasticus lineusculus were introduced. Uh, an auto route encircled the lake. Uh, we had the end of the famous drought that brought so many from uh, Arkansas and Kansas uh, west. Uh, kokanee salmon were introduced. Uh, a big event was the selection of Squaw Valley uh, for the Olympics. Uh, the Tahoe Keys project was allowed uh, by the Forest Service, uh, not uh, fully appreciating the importance of wetlands. And In fact, uh, back in the early 60s, uh, there wasn't a lot of appreciation of the importance of wetlands for uh, nutrient removal from inflowing waters. Uh, then uh, the California Nevada Department of Fish and Game uh, decided that uh, the kokanee salmon, also an, in, an exotic introduction, uh, the sockeye for red salmon uh, was introduced, and they thought they needed something more to eat. So they uh, added uh, the opossum shrimp, Mysis relicta, uh, which <coughs> proceeded to eliminate the main food supply uh, for the kokanee, uh, the cladocerans, daphnia, and bosmina. An example of uh, an introduction that uh, would not have been done had proper uh, study been done about the impact of uh, Mysis relicta on uh, the natural phytoplankton population. Uh, I was able to convince the sanitary engineers of uh, engineering science uh, with a simple bioassay experiment that the sewage even after tertiary treatment, had to be exported out of the basin. Uh, that was certainly my most uh, important uh, political victory and scientific victory at uh, Tahoe. Uh, shortly thereafter, the uh, Lodosseran population uh, crashed. Uh, here's a uh, Nevada uh, picture uh, of uh, from 1860 of Glenbrook over on the uh, east shore of Tahoe. You can see they just uh, had pretty well butchered the forest. Uh, by 1980, uh, it had recovered. This is exactly the same picture. You can see the mountain landscape. Uh, unfortunately, it came back mainly as very uh, crowded stands of uh, white fur. Uh, so they deplete the water. Uh, they allow a bark beetle infestation. Uh, when a uh, pine tree gets short of water, they aren't able to produce enough sap uh, to expel uh, beetle invaders. Uh, so in some stands at Tahoe, we have uh, up to 70 percent of the fir uh, dead or, or dying, at least in poor conditions. Uh, fortunately, this has been a great water year and uh, that's going to help those stands. Uh, one of my students, uh, Jason Snyder, uh, has been working on uh, an element that I think uh, should help bring the world together uh, to recognize that uh, air pollution is a global problem. Uh, he's been studying the transport of uh, Asian dust uh, from uh, the Gobi Desert uh, in China across the Pacific uh, to Lake Tahoe. Uh, he's been working uh, extensively with uh, one of the early uh, investigators of uh, Tahoe uh, air pollution, uh, Tom Cahill of the physics department, uh, now retired. Uh, and this is a drum that turns very slowly and sucks in air through filters so that you can actually identify uh, the uh, Asian dust. And uh, we've been able to analyze it uh, for its uh, phosphorus and trace element uh, components. 
Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this. Uh, his uh, thesis uh, we're reading now, so it ought to be available uh, shortly and, and some publications from it. Uh, this uh, is the shot uh, taken by Emery Kristoff, uh, who did the first photography of the Titanic. And uh, he had an ROV, a remote operated vehicle over here, photographing our ROV, which has a video camera in it, uh, in the uh, toilet, the marine people call it the head, of uh, the Tahoe steamer, which was uh, scuttled uh, in 1942. And we were able to find, for the first time, uh, with this ROV uh, about 20 years ago. And uh, interestingly enough, this is the sediment that had accumulated uh, in the wash basin. And notice the, how good shape the, the wood's in, the uh, porcelain isn't stained, the uh, pinch uh, faucets are, in, are still shiny uh, in this almost perfectly pH 7 water that uh, uh, fills the Tahoe Basin. Uh, another of my students, uh, Alan Habert, who's now uh, a research scientist at the Desert Research Institute, uh, took a series of cores. We, we actually bought this box coring device from, from Scripps, and then he punches out cores uh, from the uh, large sample that we bring up to the surface. And uh, if we look, we're able then to reconstruct uh, the sedimentation rate. That was sediment that had accumulated in that basin uh, over the years. And uh, back uh, during Comstock, uh, we were depositing uh, 450 uh, grams of sediment uh, per square meter of bottom. Uh, as the vegetation recovered, uh, in the basin, uh, the sedimentation rate dropped down to 90 uh, grams per square meter. And then with the post-Olympic, uh, post-World War II uh, development of the Tahoe Basin with all the roads and all the development, uh, the erosion rates accelerated uh, up uh, to 270. Uh, which is three times uh, the sedimentation rate of the intervening uh, period. Uh, we also were able with the ROV to uh, find a forest uh, in place uh, off Camp Richards over on the uh, southwest corner of the lake. And uh, by carbon dating, we uh, found that these, lake, these trees are about uh, 5,000 years old comparing to the Little Ice Age and uh, they actually grew in place on the lake bottom, which indicates that there was uh, a drought uh, that uh, probably lasted three to 400 years, if not longer, uh, to grow these trees on what is now uh, the lake bottom. There's no evidence that there was a major subsidence in this area as far as I know. So if we look at uh, the problems at Tahoe, uh, obviously the loss of transparency has caught the public attention. Uh, the League to Save Lake Tahoe uh, has come up with the idea of Keep Tahoe Blue that you see on many a bumper sticker. Uh, there's been a major change in the biodiversity in the lake, uh, largely through the introduction of uh, exotic species. Uh, we've had a lot of loss of uh, riparian and wetland habitat. Uh, the Tahoe Keys, uh, for instance, was the largest wetland in the Sierra Nevada, and it was dug up, as you'll see, for the Tahoe Keys. Uh, invasions of uh, non-native uh, biota, uh, people have accidentally and intentionally uh, added things like their aquariums uh, to the Tahoe Keys, which have spread uh, rapidly particularly Eurasian milfoil, and now we have uh, the Asian clam, uh, and uh, Turk is currently working on uh, means of controlling uh, particularly the Asian clam, and we're hopeful that the zebra mussel, which has been such a plague in the Midwest and has been moving uh, 
west uh, progressively uh, doesn't get into Tahoe. So there's now uh, a real attention to keeping the boats that are launched there clean. And of course we have toxics like PVCs, uh, mercury, and uh, we had a major series of pollution <coughs> from MTBE, trimethyl butyl ether, which uh, was a additive that uh, EPA forced on uh, the gas economy, uh, which was again a uh, very unsound addition to the fuel supply because uh, it simply meant that you burn more gas uh, and the net improvement in, in emission was uh, very, very small uh, if measurable. Uh, a lot of uh, unfortunate things happened early on. Uh, as the ski areas went in, they just simply mowed down uh, all the vegetation and we had these major erosion events. This happens to be a shot of the uh, not so heavenly, uh, heavenly valley uh, back in uh, the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, they've been trying to get uh, uh, squaw carpet and other native plants back on uh, those eroded sites ever since. Uh, of course, when you're cruising along uh, Lakeshore Boulevard here, you don't really see the extent of the uh, road work that uh, this shot shows that I took from a small plane. And uh, these roads were put in without a lot of attention to erosion control, so they've been a, a pretty general source of uh, sediments uh, to the lake. And uh, one of uh, Dr. Schlato's students uh, showed uh, quite convincingly how important uh, these fine sediments are, which are so fine that they stay in suspension for a long time, uh, contribute uh, together with the algae to the loss of transparency of the lake. Uh, Dr. Robert Derlet uh, and I have been, had a project going that's of course not popular with the cattlemen uh, on the High Sierra. As you hike the High Sierra, uh, you discover that uh, where they're bringing <coughs> cattle up and grazing above 5,000 feet, uh, there's a major uh, reduction in water quality. Uh, the cow paddies are uh, all over the place and uh, they trample around the uh, small lakes uh, and of course uh, contribute a lot of coliform uh, bacteria. This is a before grazing and after grazing, before and after, before and after, uh, where uh, we're measuring uh, the E. coli's. Uh, so the solution and uh, more and more ecologists have to focus on not just doing studies but providing uh, solutions. The Department of Environmental Science and Policy uh, was actually created uh, with the idea of uh, doing uh, more extensive applied uh, ecology and uh, that has occurred. So we'd like to phase out cattle grazing in wilderness areas. Uh, if you hike through a wilderness area and then hit a national park, I mean a U.S. Forest Service piece of land, uh, the contrast is extreme. Uh, the cattle just do a lot of damage. Uh, and the national parks have uh, been much better stewards of, of the High Sierra. So we'd like to get the cattle out above 5,000 feet and expand uh, the national parks in the High Sierra into some of this uh, Forest Service land. Of course, not popular uh, with cattlemen who have had uh, uh, grazing rights for several generations. Uh, but again, uh, they pay $3.50 a head uh, to graze those cattle on public lands, and it costs the taxpayers uh, over $8 a head to just manage the program. Uh, so it's one of those uh, areas of uh, waste that might be corrected. Uh, if we look at global warming just from the standpoint of, uh, of Lake Tahoe, uh, we find that uh, the lake has increased a full degree uh, over the last 30 years 
and uh, about four degrees in the in the surface waters. And uh, if you don't believe in global warming, uh, I think one should look carefully at this slide. Uh, this is the maximum daily temperatures. Uh, no significant trend, lots of variability. Uh, but if you look at the minimum temperatures, which are the nighttime temperatures, uh, there's been a steady increase. And this simply uh, demonstrates the blanketing effect of uh, carbon dioxide and, and methane uh, on heat loss uh, from the Earth's surface, which of course is the background for global warming. If we look at uh, warming lakes, rates at Lake Tahoe, 0.016 uh, degrees centimate, centigrade per year, uh, doesn't seem like a lot until you add a lot of years. And it just turns out that this is the, exactly the same uh, rate that we have for the Zurich Sea in, in Switzerland. Uh, whereas uh, lakes to the north, Lake Washington, uh, Lake 239 that uh, David Schindler made famous in, in uh, uh, Canada are, are warming at a, a much greater rate. Uh, one of my uh, other uh, former students, Dr. Uh, now Associate Professor Sudeep Chandra at the University of Nevada uh, has been working with a Turk member, uh, Marianne uh, Whitman, on uh, exotic introductions and their, their impact. Uh, warm water fish have been added to the Tahoe Keys. People typically would take their uh, aquaria up to the Tahoe Keys and uh, instead of taking the fish home with them uh, at the end of the summer they just dump them in and since Eurasian milfoil uh, was a particularly popular uh, higher aquatic plant in, in aquaria uh, they were added to uh, the Tahoe Keys and it spread uh, rapidly around the lake uh, causing shoaling, uh, warming and with the shoaling and the uh, aquatic plant growth uh, the warm water fish now are found all the way around uh, the lake. Uh, this uh, incidentally was a uh, shot of the uh, Tahoe Keys, the uh, Pope Marsh, uh, on uh, July the 13th in 1940. Uh, by 1967 uh, they had uh, dug the lake up uh, and produced a uh, Venice type uh, <coughs> marina set up and uh, some 20 years later uh, they had built it out and uh, had channelized the upper Truckee River which provides about 25% uh, of the inflow to Tahoe uh, into this single channel having lost all the filtering and nutrient removal uh, capacity of this wetland. Uh, certainly one of the most serious uh, perturbations of the Tahoe Basin uh, since the Comstock mining and uh, one which uh, certainly wouldn't be allowed uh, today under uh, current knowledge of the importance of, of wetland uh, plants. Uh, this is Eurasian milfoil. Uh, the Tahoe Keys spends about $100,000 a year mowing this and removing it and when they mow it uh, there are a lot of fragments left over and Tahoe seshes. The wind blows in one direction, the water gets built up downwind. When the wind stops, it rocks back and forth at about 13 hours. So water flows into the Tahoe Keys, picks up these fragments of milfoil and distribute them uh, all uh, around the uh, Tahoe Basin. Uh, here is a uh, show of uh, what have been uh, introduced uh, almost everything, brown trout, rainbow trout, brook trout, uh, the lake trout is the dominant introduction now. Uh, crayfish got in, uh, kokanee salmon uh, in the late uh, 40s, early 50s, and then the mysis relicta possum shrimp uh, introduction, uh, water milfoil, and 
uh, large and smallmouth bass. Uh, what we lost uh, were the native cutthroat trout, which came up from Pyramid Lake to spawn in the tributaries of Lake Tahoe, and uh, as I mentioned, the Cladoceran, uh, Daphnia, uh, and uh, Bosmina, the other uh, Cladoceran. Now, this is a close up of uh, the opossum shrimp, uh, Mysis relicta. Those big eyes enable it to operate very low uh, light concentrations, and uh, they drop into the uh, abyss, the dark waters of Tahoe, uh, every day. They're negatively phototactic, so uh, the sight feeding uh, kokanee that they were introduced to feed uh, actually never get a shot at them. Uh, this is Bosmina. Uh, people did not believe that Tahoe was changing uh, from my transparency measurements. You know, the lake looked plenty clear, and the fact that it was losing a foot of transparency per year uh, certainly made no impression on a largely uh, shore-based population. But uh, when Tahoe began to develop this uh, paraphyton or attached algal growth, uh, this is Gomphineus uh, herculeum, a stalk diatom which attaches to the bottom. Uh, people began to slip and slide around on this slimy uh, subsurface. Uh, they began to uh, recognize that uh, Tahoe was changing. And uh, as soon as uh, solar radiation begins to increase uh, in uh, April and uh, May, uh, it bleaches white. It looks like it snowed on the bottom here, doesn't it? It breaks loose and comes up as a noxious uh, decaying uh, mat. Uh, near shore, and in this case in the Tao uh, boat works. Uh, primary productivity, which has been kind of my thing over the years, uh, has increased uh, at uh, about 5% uh, per year. Uh, as nutrients increased uh, in the lake from an increasingly disturbed watershed, uh, we were able to export the sewage out of the basin, or I don't think I'd be giving uh, this lecture about uh, Tahoe's condition today. Uh, transparency varies greatly and largely uh, on the basis of uh, how cold a winter we have and uh, how much mixing occurs. Uh, nutrients are constantly being regenerated in the deeper portion of the lake as algal cells, uh, fish, zooplankton, and so on, uh, die, uh, fall into the deep uh, waters of Tahoe's 500 uh, meters deep. It's about the 11th, as I recall, it's the 11th deepest lake in the world. Uh, but Tahoe doesn't mix every year. It takes a very cold winter and a very strong winter storm to turn that water all the way over. Uh, many students, uh, in fact I always start my uh, first lecture off uh, which, with asking the students uh, whether they could mix uh, warmer water, lighter water, but with more or less energy than colder, heavier water. And it's uh, counterintuitive. 98% uh, of them always say it's going to take less energy to mix the warmer water. And I've drawn a couple of containers on the board, one with uh, four degree and five degree water, and then uh, 25 and 26 degree water. And it turns out that it takes 30 times as much energy to mix 25 and 26 degree water as it does to mix four and five degree water, because the density difference between 25 and 26 is uh, 30 times the density difference uh, between four and five degree water. So it takes a cold winter and a late winter storm to mix Tahoe. Uh, the other thing that happens is when uh, we have droughts, uh, transparency increases because nutrient rich water and sediment particles aren't resuspended in the upper water. Uh, this uh, shows uh, 1983 
1988, uh, a politician took this data to Washington and uh, tried to uh, prevent uh, us from getting uh, Burton Santini funding for uh, research on the lake on the grounds that uh, Goldman had solved the problems at Tahoe, need, no need uh, for any more research. So I had to write a white paper, uh, deliver it to Washington uh, on the matter. We had another uh, similar event uh, from 1997 to 2002 uh, during a similar uh, drought period where we weren't getting uh, complete mixing. Uh, taking the same data, uh, Turk uh, has smoothed this a bit and uh, even uh, with these drought periods shown here, uh, we're hoping that this increase uh, in, uh, or the decrease in transparency uh, is leveling off and we'll begin to see a, a gradual improvement with all of the uh, land management uh, efforts that Dr. Schlotto and uh, John Ruder uh, have been accomplishing uh, in the basin. Uh, we are beginning to lose oxygen. I'm going to speed up now. Uh, and I wanted to put a plug in for uh, Castle Lake, which has a full uh, 50 three years of, uh, of data, and uh, we just completed our 53rd uh, oversnow field trip uh, to Castle Lake this last uh, weekend. Uh, the snowpack was just incredible. We had to uh, cut a long way through the snowpack to get to the ice, uh, to get to the water, uh, to do our, our winter sampling. Uh, I also like to stress in this talk the importance of getting to the younger generation. And uh, uh, my wife Nancy's daughter uh, is right over there. Uh, she attended uh, one of the uh, children's days that are now, uh, I guess, in the 11th year. Uh, we set this up at Sand Harbor where uh, the kids came in, uh, the graduate students uh, set up uh, displays. Uh, we now have the League, uh, the Tahoe Bike Hall Institute, uh, the USGS also uh, participating in this. Uh, we give them all t-shirts, uh, pop and uh, pizza. Take them in, uh, at this time we took them all out on, on one of the uh, major uh, vessels uh, tourist vessels on the lake, pulled up with our research boat, the John LeConte, handed live samples of uh, zooplankton aboard, and uh, it was quite a hit. And uh, the children then go home and talk to their parents, and uh, you have a whole new generation of conservation-minded uh, youngsters. Uh, and of course, uh, biopolitical activity at Tahoe uh, which in some ways helped put Davis on the, on the map since uh, it got worldwide coverage. Uh, we had Clinton and Gore both out on the boat uh, for an hour. And uh, he's saying, President Clinton and Vice President Al Gore examined Lake Tahoe water samples with Lake researcher Charles Goldman Wright the minute we got to the boat. I got my biology 101 course, Clinton said. Well. Regardless of your view of Clinton, I have never met a more charismatic individual in my life. I mean, when he talks to you, you feel like there's just absolutely nobody else. Most politicians, and my mother ran for Congress twice, so I saw a few of them back in Illinois, they have their hand on your shoulder and they're looking around to see who they really should be talking to. But Clinton has this incredible ability to just focus and he's really smart. Uh, and Gore wasn't a bit uh, wooden either on this. Uh, I think when you're vice president, what do you do? You just got to stand there behind the president. You can't <laughs> say anything or do anything. I, I think that's how the press figured Gore was uh, wooden. And of course, last but not least, uh, I spent at least four years of my uh, career, maybe five, uh, helping to raise the funds uh, to build the Turk uh, Center. 
and we now have a fabulous crew of, of researchers, uh, many of them uh, holder overs from the Tahoe uh, Research Group. Uh, John Ruder is the uh, associate director, one of my former students. Uh, Bob Richards uh, was captain of our research boat uh, for many years, and uh, you already know that Jeff Schlato is the boss. Uh, it's been a very good group, and uh, we've had, uh, I think, a very successful and continuing run uh, on research uh, at Lake Tahoe. Uh, J.T. Ravis, uh, who contributed this picture, <laughs> Uh, gave a whole series of really good pictures uh, to Turk and uh, if you have not been up to uh, the Turk uh, facility at Tahoe uh, you're all of course invited we have a whole series of uh, docents there to show you around uh, the first floor uh, was essentially uh, paid for by uh, what was the uh, drugstore long foundation uh, now sold out to CVS, um, who gave us uh, two million dollars and we were able to put a, a very nice uh, visitor center on the first floor, classrooms on the second, and uh, our labs on the third. Uh, I'm just going to end up with what is really a popular talk. I can get this many in for a talk like this but I can get a thousand in if you want to give a uh, talk about USOs, unidentified swimming objects. Uh, what's a, what about USOs? Have you ever seen one? They're constantly reported. Do you think they're real? Here is a short tutorial. And uh, if we go back to Ulysses Aldrovande, uh, his students published a uh, really uh, uh, interesting uh, book that he had started showing what people used to think were sea monsters. Uh, the original picture of the Loch Ness monster uh, was of course a forgery. Uh, some say that's an elephant actually going across a river that was inserted with its trunk out of the water. Uh, others say it was a float. Uh, the man on his deathbed admitted it was a fraud. Uh, but uh, I got a trip to Loch Ness uh, by uh, legendary Nessie hunter uh, Robert Rains from MIT and even after a week he died uh, recently I was not able to ascertain whether he believed in the Loch Ness monster or was just keeping it going uh, but he brought a million dollar piece of equipment over I'm launching it there and uh, he said we were looking for the remnants of Nessie uh, there's Nancy with, you can see, uh, uh, it's uh, really important commercial stuff there at Loch Ness. A lot of Scotch whiskey and, and uh, lots of uh, Nessies. And of course there are sea monsters. Uh, this is a, an oar fish, uh, 400 pounds, 20 to 30 feet long, that was actually collected. Uh, and we have our own Davis student, Seb Hogan. Uh, who's been collecting monster fish uh, all over the world. Uh, this is a taiman uh, collected from a Mongolian river and they can reach uh, 200 pounds. So uh, they get big and they eat mice and things like that. With that, uh, I will quit. Yes, Alicia. Well, how many other lakes in the world uh, get so much financial support, so much protection, so much research going on there? Good question. We're trying to generate that for Adilon now, which is a beautiful mountain lake, uh, but uh, we'll never uh, be able to achieve that sort of support. Uh, partly, uh, it's the fact that uh, a really elitist group of uh, San Franciscans settled along the west shore and uh, with their beautiful property uh, didn't want to see the lake uh, decline in quality and they set up the uh, 
lead to say Lake Tahoe, which now has a better budget, I think, than our research program, probably. And uh, they actually gave us a modest contribution to build the facility. But uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, Frank Sinatra and the Rack Pat hung up at the North Shore. Tahoe was getting a lot of publicity before uh, we arrived. And uh, then, uh, since it's Forest Service land, uh, they're the 90-pound the, the gorilla getting most of the money that they uh, portion out as they see fit for, uh, for research and, and forest practices work. So it's a rather unique uh, situation. Plus, it's the entire water supply for Reno, Nevada. And uh, that gives it, and keep in mind that Senator Reed is uh, the leading uh, Senate senator, and uh, he has quite a bit of clout and has been responsible for, uh, well, he was responsible actually for getting Clinton and Gore to come visit Tahoe. That was some sort of a political promise that he paid off on. And as a result, uh, Clinton said they would spent a billion dollars over 20 years to fix Tahoe. And I don't know how much of that we've gone through. Uh, recent uh, allocations have been greatly reduced. But I think that's the reason. It's just had a lot of publicity uh, for a lot of years. And it's been an a <coughs> important gambling center and an important vacation center for a lot of people. So it's, uh, that's why. Yes. So um, <coughs> um, I, I mentioned when we uh, talked before your, uh, before your seminar here, but I, you gave a talk about 25 years ago about uh, this long-term data on, on mm -hmm. Tahoe, and I wondered if you could speak to that uh, some. I'm sure. impressed with that because well, uh, 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 50 years instead of 25 years. Actually, uh, Lake Tahoe and, and Castle Lake probably have the longest, uh, best data sets uh, on the western co on the west coast, and uh, without long-term data in ecology. Uh, the variations in, in weather alone uh, make it very hard to, to come to positive conclusions about what data is, is showing. And uh, without that long data set, we couldn't have uh, certainly concluded that Tahoe was warming. Uh, but it's a wonderful condenser, really, for uh, climatic change. Uh, so I guess one of the take-home messages, I'm glad you asked this question, is that long-term data uh, in, in ecology is uh, extremely important uh, if you're going to make uh, the right uh, decisions in terms of land and, and uh, habitat management. Yes? So what is the outlook for Tahoe in the context of climate change over the next 50 years? Well, uh, the, the worst news is that mixing is likely to become less and less frequent. That means it'll be very clear, at the, it'll be stay clear at the surface, people will conclude it's improving, but then when it mixes it will have accumulated uh, more and more nutrients so you'll get bigger <laughs> fluctuations in, in productivity. Uh, the other thing is that if uh, it doesn't mix, then eventually it'll become more and more like a tropical lake and we'll lose the oxygen at the sediment water interface and we'll begin to lose phosphorus, a major limiting factor now, uh, from the sediments. Uh, ferric uh, phosphate will switch back to ferrous <coughs> and out it'll come into the water column and uh, eutrophication will proceed and the lake trout, which depend on the bottom of the lake for their lifestyle, along with the sculpins, uh, are, will begin to disappear. Mm -hmm. So Charles, along those lines, I guess what people often worry about for uh, entire systems is whether or not there is a tipping point, you know, a regime shift. Uh, you have a sense of mechanisms here to worry about? I mean, it, it sounds like what you were just saying could easily do that. Yeah, I think climate yeah. change uh, could easily be the tipping point for, for uh -huh. Tahoe. Uh, 
fortunately, the sewage has been going out of the basin since the uh, late 60s when we convinced them they had to export the sewage. Uh, simply by putting their tertiary treatment water into mid lake water, we turned it green in, in three days in a bioassay. <coughs> and that convinced this elite group of sanitary engineers from Stanford, Berkeley, <coughs> and Wisconsin uh, that they couldn't put the sewage after tertiary treatment back into the lake. Uh, so that was a, a really important slowing. We certainly Science has certainly slowed down uh, the demise of, of Lake Tahoe. Um, as time progresses and we get the erosion under control, uh, we're able to get more of the runoff into settling ponds and, uh, and artificial wetlands. Uh, we may be able to uh, turn the tide, level off this declining uh, transparency, and uh, show some real improvement. And then we might go into a glacial age. How will cool down again and it'll mix more. That'll fix it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you.